The last time I saw Jonathan Porritt was around a year ago. It was not long after the death of my dearest friend and long-term colleague, Polly Higgins, with whom I co-founded the Stop Ecocide campaign. We were talking about the fact that it was also shortly after the April rebellion and also the UK government had announced climate emergency, as had many of the councils across the country. Uh, and Jonathan was putting his extensive experience and wisdom to work, thinking about what were the next stages of how we could take action on this. And I'm delighted to be able to speak to Jonathan today and look forward to investigating some of that more in depth in this conversation. Jonathan, lovely to see you again. Jojo, lovely to spend some time with you. It's great. <laughs> So the theme of our conversation today um, is, is changing the rules. Um, and I think in, in our respective ways, we are both actively working on doing that. Um, so perhaps um, we could start with uh, just asking you what, what arenas and in what ways um, is that your focus right now? I guess it's always been a big part of how I've tried to make sense of sustainability because at the moment we don't have much choice but to try and make the world more sustainable within a set of rules that make it impossible to make the world more sustainable. I don't know if that makes any sense, but literally these underpinning rules about um, the economy, for instance, and governance issues, how we relate to each other in our democracies and elsewhere, and some of the basic rules about what you're allowed to call progress and what you're not allowed to call progress. These are such incredibly deep framing issues in our society that much of what we do on the surface as it were around sustainability around environment around justice it's constantly missing the mark because the actual rules the deep rules that make our economies work remain completely unchanged from crisis to crisis I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you could give us a, a couple of examples of some of those rules that have now become sort of so embedded that they're, they're not even really spoken about. I think the one that is bound to be looming very large in our lives now is it won't be permissible to talk about any solutions to the economic problems we now face that aren't based on more economic growth and getting as much economic growth back into our economies as fast as we possibly can, as measured by completely conventional indicators, GDP, per capita expenditure, and so on. Nobody in Treasury, nobody in the Department of Business will be giving any thought whatsoever to the idea that there are actually different ways of bringing prosperity back into people's lives, of creating the kind of economic and social conditions that make life better for people. If you can't do it in a way that aligns with this obsessive approach to economic growth, you won't get a hearing. So for me, it's gonna be a real battle because you can see that the environment groups are having to say, they've already started to say, okay, so the things we need to go for are the things that will generate economic growth quickly. Big infrastructure projects, maybe because that helps with the GDP side of it, anything that will help meet conventional economic indicators. So I know that's gonna be a big battle and it's not an easy time to, to fight that battle, to be honest, because everybody wants to see purchasing power coming back into the economy. That's wholly understandable. Yeah, it's it's a really huge issue. It's a really huge problem. Um, and I think one of the things uh, from our perspective, from looking at, at it from the legal framework perspective, um, is that this whole model of growth actually doesn't interact very well with reality. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, effectively, you know, you can you can believe all you like in infinite growth um, on a finite planet. But sooner or later, reality is going to catch up to you. I mean, you know, yeah. I often think about the fact that, you know, you know, you can maintain that the earth is flat, but if you keep walking west for long enough, you know, you'll, you'll be proved wrong. Um, and, you know, we're in a similar situation now with, I think, our economic attitudes versus what is actually possible um, and, you know, harmonious and, and useful on a planet which we've all got to share. Um, yeah. And I, th I think, I mean, one of the things that's been interesting for us to, to observe in all of this is that 
there's still not a lot of discussion of how the legal framework fits into all of this. Um, there's very much um, a sort of focus on, on the economic side, which is, of course, hugely important. I mean, everybody you know, spends most yeah. of their lives in some engagement with the economy, of course. But there's this... Um, there's this kind of blind spot where it comes to some of the sort of moral and legal frameworks um, that, that we operate in. And uh, Stop Ecocide is, is very much a kind of a, I suppose I could call it a one trick pony um, in the sense that the one thing that we campaign for is making mass damage and destruction of the earth uh, illegal at, at the international level. Um, but it's interesting how um, that kind of relationship of, um, you know, sort of faith and reality is really showing up in the space we're working in. So, for example, you know, you have, um, you know, leaders like, uh, you know, Trump and Johnson and Bolsonaro, um, who are, you know, very much in the, uh, you know, have this sort of deep faith in the, the, the economic growth model um, that is somehow not reflecting reality. And yet you have faith leaders like Pope Francis, like the indigenous leaders um, around the world who are actually trying to wake us up to the reality of what's yeah. happening around us. And there's this extraordinary irony uh, in that um, that is, is really becoming very, very obvious right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely right. And I think on the legal side, it is, it's fascinating for me because in a way that I'm sort of very conscious of the gap between the stop eco side, big picture story, which would have a massive impact on the ways in which governments, developers, planners, ordinary citizens thought about their obligation to protect the natural world, its ecosystems and so on. The gap between that and then what we have now, which is a body of environmental law which is exercised with varying degrees of um, efficiency in different countries, depending on how strongly the rule of law obtains in those countries. I mean, the scary thing going on, well, of many scary things going on in the US at the moment, is the speed with which President Trump has dismantled really critical parts of the body of environmental law, which were created in the end of the 70s through into the 80s, which have been the absolute building blocks of legal approaches to protecting the planet, ecosystem, species, and so on. And what is intriguing for me now is to see the speed with which some voices, you mentioned Brazil, but some voices in Brazil, the US, actually in some of our own European neighbors, in Hungary, for instance, the voices which say, we can't afford these environmental protections these legal constraints on our economies now, we need to lift those in order to create the wealth that we're gonna need for the future. And that worries me enormously because it's already a big enough step up from that body of environmental law to stop ecocide to an ecocide law. If you start weakening that legal infrastructure, boy, we are in, we're in real trouble then, real trouble. Yeah, I think this is this is very disturbing. Um, at the same time, there's an in, we we do find ourselves in a very interesting uh, point in history, a, a truly unique point that you've also mentioned and, and called an inflection point. Um, and I think there's this kind of sense that there are these crises are converging, um, and that um, there is something that happens in that space, which is th that things that have previously been impossible can become possible mm. um, because, you know, that window of, you know, none of us know where all this is going, um, can somehow create a, a space for something, something else to happen. I mean, um, I've often heard people um, say, we don't have time to do something as, as extreme or as, as, as foundational as putting in place an ecocide law and of course you know our response to that is we actually don't have time not to we certainly don't have time not to expand that conversation um and there's a way in which uh, politically now um I mean, we can understand, of course, that jurisdiction by jurisdiction, so at a national level, um, to making a move as strong as criminalizing ecocide is actually very scary for governments. Um, yeah. Because, you know, it, I mean, and, and, and let's face it, if something like that was brought in overnight, it'd be absolute chaos. Um, you know, the courts wouldn't cope, politicians wouldn't know where to put themselves. You know, I mean, it, it, you, know, every, <laughs> it would, you know, and so much of our economic activity worldwide 
is based on practices that at their worst, you know, can be ecocidal, but obviously, yeah, exactly, exactly, you know, that, that, that would be hugely problematic. However, um, what we focus on specifically is a change at the International Criminal Court. Yeah. Um, in other words, a change to international criminal law. Now, one of the advantages of that in this context is that it's not something that can proceed immediately. I mean, the procedure itself takes anything between three to seven years, let's say an average of, of five years. The last time international law was amended, it, it took seven years. Um, but then when we look at how long it took to, you know, from 1992 until 20. 15 the Paris Agreement you know for a climate agreement that took rather a lot longer so you know potentially we are looking at something that is not instant yeah. but nevertheless has a kind of automatic transition period built into it so that as soon as uh, you know states start saying that they support this idea they can safely know that nothing will happen immediately but that they will have some years to adapt to the possibility that actually you know, those in positions of responsibility could become personally liable to prosecution. And yeah. history shows that a criminal law has an enforceable deterrent effect in a way that any size of body of environmental regulation could never reach. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of current uh, angle that we're, we're taking, because, you know, we believe that Actually, most countries, and obviously, as you've already said, you know, there are places like America where the environmental regulations are getting dismantled. However, there are also places around the world who are, which are taking seriously the, the idea of, you know, a, a green recovery from the pandemic situation we find ourselves in. And there are many countries that we believe will want to be seen to be moving in the right direction yeah um so you know we're, we're we're hoping and trusting that actually this conversation around ecocide law is starting to become more politically appealing and also safer at the international level yeah no i think that's right and i think there are lots of things about how we recover from covid19 how we make the world a better place in the future lots of things which will change the tone of conversations, not just the measures that are brought forward, but the ways in which people feel in themselves about the relative importance of things. So let's be honest, Jojo, we've both struggled for many years with the fact that not enough people feel passionately about the natural world. They just don't. It's been a kind of bit part player in their lives. And I'm really fascinated to see now that we're beginning to get different perspectives on that. And I think when the inquiry process around COVID-19 emerges and the link with the continuing pattern of deforestation and the exposure of human beings to increased risk through habitat destruction, the release of a lot of very dangerous pathogens from a human point of view, 70% of these pathogens now can be shown to come from environments which have been degraded in one way or another over the course of the last few decades. The notion of zoonotic diseases now impacting on human society in a massive way. And people are beginning to wake up. You hear people saying, well, when is the next pandemic coming? And the only answer to that is, well, the next pandemic is absolutely guaranteed unless we rethink our relationship with the natural world. And I want, to, I want to change the rules about how people talk about our relationship with nature, because we do need to go back into a lot of that relational side of things, how people see themselves in the world, how they understand their relationship with the world, what they can do to nurture, foster good relationships. And that means, as you know, because you're, I know, passionate about this, thinking again about education, and how we rebuild educational systems so that nature is at the heart of those systems. Every young person through their lives comes to understand the, not just the interconnectivity, but the interdependency between us and the natural world. So I'm, I think it's gonna be a, a utterly extraordinary period of time when as long as we can keep the conversations focused on these deep philosophical, spiritual, relationship issues, then I think we've got a better chance of bringing forward some of these very dramatic interventions, as you said, an ecocide law or changes in the way we think about economic development. These are huge things, but we will find it a more conducive atmosphere 
to bring forward some of those ideas as a consequence of what we've learned, I think, through COVID-19. I hope. <laughs> Gosh, I yeah. hope so too. And I think you've really hit on one of the fundamental issues that we're all dealing with um, culturally and globally, and that is, you know, a, a, an issue of mindset. Um, yeah. That you know we have this very deeply ingrained uh, in the in the I say so-called first world culture. Um, we have um, very deeply ingrained sense of separation separation from yep. nature separation from each other um and i think that I mean, particularly at the moment with what's been going on in america i think there's um it, it can be easy to you know for the environmental movement or they, i think the environmental movement needs to be very careful not to end up with a kind of opposition that's direct opposition between nature and humanity because actually what we're dealing with here is um a difficulty of understanding of how connected we all are to each other and to you know the web of life you know uh, as a whole um, and that things like racial injustice and inequality are deeply intertwined with this separation from nature as well you know there's this um it's it's people and planet that have all become Kind of divorced from each other in a way that we we somehow make we make nature other just as the way we make other people other um and this is something yeah. again that i believe yeah. we've got a lot to learn from indigenous cultures around this in terms of the understanding you know mm -hmm. that you know that we are all connected and that it's uh, you know our economic structures and our, our mindsets have sort of led a certain you know privileged few if you like to actually treat other people and nature as resources. Um, and that's something that's really being thrown into relief right now. Mm. I think that's absolutely right. And the, the, as you described it, the othering of nature has been going on for decades, of course. I mean, just in the most extraordinary way is that we have alienated ourselves from that natural world. And the speed with which young children, for instance, who don't start with any of that alienation from the natural world, they start with a completely natural inbuilt reciprocity between them and that physical environment that they're in. The speed with which we manage to root that out of kids and get them into this sense of nature out there, but we're here, is astonishing. And you have to pin a lot of that on utterly dysfunctional educational systems. But I also agree with you that we can open up a very different approach to this in terms of thinking about sources of wisdom in this area, particularly indigenous people, as you've said. But there are so many other wise ways of looking at that relationship between ourselves and the natural world. We don't have to do this all via the medium of quite transactional science or whatever else it might be. We have to rethink it at that deeper level as well. And I'm hugely heartened by the way people want to engage at that level. It's not irrelevant to the way we now keep this agenda much more vibrant than perhaps it's been in the past. Yeah, I, I think uh, you've, you've touched on now at least um, two key arenas, education and economics, um, where we, you know, we need to look at some quite fundamental changes. And um, I'm aware that you're bringing a new book out at the end of this month called Hope in Hell, um, where you're going to be addressing a whole range of things, I think, in terms of how we can face and potentially transform the situation we're in. Would you like to say a little bit more about that forthcoming book and what you address in it? Yeah, yes, Which, when, and thank you for that opportunity. So it's called Hope in Hell, it's coming out on June the 24th. And actually one of the most critical things that I've tried to do is to say, you've got to get out of your own narrow camps of interest and concern. So you've got the climate change camp and then you've got the biodiversity camp and you've got lots of people who don't understand that these two things are completely inextricable, that you can't really talk about climate change unless you understand what's happening with the natural world and vice versa as a biodiversity person. More complicated though, Jojo, and this has always been controversial in the green movement, is people still think there's a world of difference between social justice and sustainability from a physical, from an environmental point of view. And again, this is just insane. It is impossible to envision a more sustainable world without putting justice at the heart of it and we can see that now in so many parts of the world not least in what's happening in america right now so the book is quite critical about a lot of the 
environment groups that historically have failed to understand the notion of social justice being a non-negotiable condition for effectiveness in environmental work. And we don't have here in the UK, we've never had the equivalent of what they've had in the US where they have a very strong environmental justice movement. And in fact, you can hear in a lot of the outrage in black voices, black and, and ethnic minority voices in America at the moment, you can hear decades worth of pain caused by the infliction of huge environmental damage to their communities. There was a period of time in American history where whatever it was, a chemicals factory, a refinery, a, a, you know, a, a lead factory, for instance, take all of these things, they were just dumped on essentially black communities in southern states. And the historical damage done to millions, millions of people now is just being brought through again in this current concern um, about justice in America. So for me, you can't separate these two things out. If you want to be serious about sustainability, you've got to be serious about social justice. And that means you have to commit to a very different understanding of what wealth is going to look like in the future and how that wealth is going to be distributed. Otherwise, honestly, continue with the very important environment work that you're doing, but please don't think it's actually going to change any of the basic rules that have to be changed because it won't. I think that the, the really key thing for me, Jojo, is the concept of ecocide is a, a really difficult one to get through to people because it doesn't spring naturally into their minds. And as you said, you've got a challenge that you've got a long-term time frame in which you have to get these things delivered. So for me, the, and we've talked about this, is how does Stop Ecocide as a campaign keep people fresh and alive and on the case, even as the procedural, the diplomatic moves are going on in the background with all the key contacts that you and Polly, of course, built up over so many years. How do you keep people focused on what needs to happen now to sustain that energy? And that's the sort of way in which Stop Ecoside materializes in our lives now as interested and concerned people. What's the connection between what you're doing, for instance, and the need to re-energize um, environment conservation nature groups here in the UK? How do we connect with the educational um, establishment to change the rules for education? So that's my... That's my question for you, as it were, which is how does this absolutely critical cause that you are single-mindedly taking forward, as you said, over the next six, seven years, whatever it might be, what happens in the interim to keep that big picture alive in people's minds? So I think um, there are a couple of things that can spring to mind in response to that. Um, one is to look again at what you were saying about the difficulty of messaging it. And one of the things that's, that we found that's very interesting is, and, and, and we've worked on this, and of course Polly worked on it for years before that, um, is you know, how do we convey the importance of criminalizing damage and destruction to nature um, in a way that has people understand mm. what a foundational piece it is and one of the sort of lines of thinking that we've that that is really starting to make sense to people is making a bit of a comparison between the social justice side that you were talking about earlier um, and the environmental justice side so um, it would, of course, be really difficult to campaign for social justice or for human rights if it were still permitted to go ahead and kill lots of people. You know, it's, it's not. That's illegal. That's, uh, it's a crime. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's accepted the world over to be completely morally beyond the pale. It's not something you can accept. And so, you know, there is a basis on which to campaign for, uh, for, for human rights and for social justice. But the environmental movement doesn't have that same basis. Um, you know, there is no fundamental criminal law internationally that says, you know, beyond this amount of damage you simply cannot do that level of harm is unacceptable so that foundational piece is missing and often you know people in very, lots of different environmental campaigns and of course you know ordinary people who have their own particular areas of environmental concern whether that might be you know for their local woodland whether that might be saving the whales you know whether that might be um supporting you know, preventing deforestation in the Amazon. There's so many different things. But 
sort of underlying all of this is the fact that it's actually yeah. permitted to destroy nature and huge tracts of nature, um, you know, with, with impunity. Um, and it's yeah. really that this, yeah. this level of harm, this ecocide, is ultimately, over decades, what has brought us to, you know, the brink of extinction and levels of biodiversity, you know, to the brink of extinction with related to, to climate change. Um, and so there's something about people understanding yeah. this fundamental piece that I think can really help there. And the second thing is that uh, is what you were highlighting about the time taken to move this forward. Now, I think what perhaps is mm. underestimated by many people is the sheer power of expanding this simple conversation that ecocide should be an international crime and to do so with many different voices. You know, again, looking at all of those who, you know, who want to support dealing with the environment in a different way and there are many many different arenas um is is the power of talking about it but also the power of the first steps of this process so unlike putting a new law in place where you have all the parties who are, who are interested sort of effectively kind of thrashing this out over a, over a length of time and potentially bigger interests being able to silence the smaller ones and so on in, in the instance that we're working with at the International Criminal Court, the situation is somewhat different because the amendment procedure is already set down and each nation, no matter its size, has the same uh, equivalent vote. So a small Pacific island has the same potential to propose this amendment to international law as any of the G20 countries. Yeah. Um, and what I think is, as I say, underestimated is the power of actually taking forward that conversation, which is, is now beginning on a state level because two island states have now said at the International Criminal Court publicly and officially called for consideration of ecocide crime. But as soon as a state actually proposes an amendment, that kind of puts the writing on the wall. It says this procedure has been begun. And at that point, we can be looking to uh, those who are at the beginning of, you know, the cycle of extraction and manufacturing and so on. So those who finance it, you know, the banks, the, and, and those, who, those who insure it as well, will be keeping a close eye on that. They'll be looking at that and thinking, okay, this is not yeah. here now, but it's been started. And in a few years time, we could be looking at very different rules. We could be looking at the fact that what we're doing now might be criminal or what we're financing now might be criminal. And that brings me back to a conversation that Polly Higgins, with whom I started this yeah. campaign, uh, had with the head of a bank back in 2012. And she actually asked this man, you know, why is it that you continue to finance this destructive industrial activity? And he simply looked her in the face and said, it's not a crime. And that to me, you know, really sums up, you know, what we're dealing with. So potentially yeah, well, just putting in place the beginnings of this process can start to shift that and start to steer the, the, the actions in the real world, in the economic world um, of what people are doing in order to yeah. prevent the destructive practices longer term. Yeah, no, I can absolutely buy into that. I mean, I think it's, you must be heartened, though, by the degree to which there are measures going on, campaigns going on all the time to stop what I would call aspects of ecocide. So if you think, for instance, of the campaign to stop the trade in illegal wildlife, this is one of the most vicious forms of international crime that exists in the world today. And it is huge. We're talking about tens of billions, hundreds of billions of, of dollars exploiting and abusing animals in terms of different trading relationships. Now, one hope we have to have is that post COVID-19, when we look at the trade in, in illegal trade in wildlife, particularly in pangolins, which people have been focusing on, the energy of all of that campaign to make the trade in wildlife completely illegal is going to ramp up immediately. There's a fantastic campaign going on in the UK at the moment, as you know, to make trophy hunting, or at least the import of trophy trophies from uh, these this incredibly cruel business of killing wild animals to make it illegal to bring trophies back into the uk now these are what i would call tiny splinters of the, of the total ecocide picture but boy do we need each and every one of those different campaigning initiatives to create the momentum around ecocide as a generic way 
of changing the rules. There's a much bigger, more important substantive thing, but we still need those small elements that make up the bigger picture. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's not even that we still need them. I think it's absolutely essential. And, you know, one of the things that's really been emerging over the last year is the vital importance of, you know, the all of these different um, activist campaigns and specifically focused campaigns and NGOs really um, coming onto a page and, you know, realizing that we are all part of, you know, the same shift that we're trying to make at a really fundamental yeah. level to bring us to a world where we can operate in harmony exactly. with nature exactly. and and i think i mean it's interesting i've spoken at conferences where uh, long-term environmental activists have been a bit disgruntled about um the attention that for example extinction rebellion and fridays for future and the youth strikes have been getting in you know when they know that they and many others have been working on this for decades and they're in their particular arenas and you know there's there is a little bit of a sense of you know who who are these upstarts you know who, who, who are suddenly sort of getting all the attention when we've done all the work now of course my 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 personal reaction to that is that actually what we should be doing is saying you know yes okay these these may be the new kids on the block but they've done something that's made the window bigger of conversation and that's allowed you know all of this work that we've all put in over those decades and and i came to this from the anti-fracking um community so you know i'm aware of that feeling you know but it, it's it sort of behoves yeah. us to acknowledge the fact that we now have that window to all speak together um and that that work can now be brought into the open and discussed in a way that wasn't possible before precisely because that that movement of mass mobilization and civil disobedience has widened the window of what is permissible to talk about and that that is such a huge thing. Polly Higgins and I used to kind of sit in our office, you know, almost feeling like the, the kids at the back of the classroom kind of going, you know, it's a no brainer, you know, over here, over here, you know, and, and, and now because of this, this massive development in terms of it, the expansion of the conversation, you know, that can be heard. And I think that is also true of many incredible environmental campaigns that have been carried on over the last few decades. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, we, yeah, never underestimate the opportunity for environmental organizations to fall out amongst themselves <laughs> or to have petty rivalries or to see their work as being so much more important than anybody else's work. I mean, honestly, I've lived with that stuff for the best part of 50 years, and I'm afraid it's not much better now than it used to be. But I think I actually take heart from the eruption of Extinction Rebellion and the school strikes movement in our midst. It's been wholly positive to me. And it has required people who've been at this for a very long time to interrogate the degree to which they need to change, rethink things, not in any way to criticize all the work that's gone before. I do think Extinction Rebellion made a, a fundamental mistake when it launched by being far too critical of all the incredible work that had preceded their emergence in our lives. It wasn't necessary. You don't make your own cause stronger by dissing what everybody else has done to promote that cause. And I'm really pleased at the change of strategy that we've seen in XR in 2020. It's a very marked change in tone, in respect for people who've been working away at this stuff for a very long time. So I really welcome that. And I think established environment organizations now are much more comfortable with the idea that there, as you put it, this range of tactical approaches to this has been widened again. I come from the Green Party and Friends of the Earth. Nonviolent direct action is written into the philosophical um, basis of the Green Party as a critical thing, which we feel to be an important part of politics today. So this is an old inheritance, if you like. And I love the way that XR has been very respectful of that inheritance and really has dug deep into the history of nonviolent direct action. That's a very significant thing that they've, that they've done there. So for me, it's just amplified those voices, given them legitimacy in, in a way that perhaps wasn't the case before. And we've got a wider repertoire to call on now, but it all has to ramp up. We can't do this without civil disobedience. I'm really sorry for people listening to this who think that we can change the rules just by being really nice and polite and changing, you know, signing a few more petitions and doing a little bit more clicktivism and perhaps donating a bit to a 
charity here or whatever it might be. None of this is going to be sufficient. I think deep down, we all know that. Deep down, this all comes back to the politics of what makes our relationship with the natural world so distorted. And that means much more pressure on politicians. And that will include very significant levels of civil disobedience to force them, if you like, to move further and faster than they're otherwise inclined to do. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think the historical aspect, you know, shows the power of that. I mean, when we look back at the suffragettes, we look at the civil rights movement, uh, we look at Gandhi salt marshes, uh, marches, you know, we see that civil disobedience, and interestingly, civil disobedience has a complement in law change. You know, that actual, that combination has actually, you know, repeatedly yep been what has moved things yeah, yeah. forward and i think what's interesting there is that um you know when those laws have been changed you know whether it's to give women the vote whether that was as a result of the civil rights movement you know it's been because the moral outrage has been adequate to that and that's what's created the civil disobedience and it, i had a, a lot of people over the last year i'm sure many people have heard this oh you know i completely sympathize with extinction rebellions you know ideas and motives but um i don't really like the way they go about it now of course you know if i were extinction rebellion i would be you know smiling and putting a tick somewhere saying that's a win because ultimately it means that those people are talking about it in a way that they would not have done. And so, you know, the, it, it's, it's blindingly obvious, I think, and, and you'll know this better than anyone because of the sheer length of time that you've been working in this arena, that unless those, you know, that level of noise is made, it is virtually impossible to get the attention um, from the media yeah. and also through to, you know, elected government officials. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's completely essential and the polarized in quality of it yeah. is actually part of that but do you do you share with me jojo this sense of a, a completely different feeling about young people and what they've brought to bear on this i mean I, i've seen many as you said i've seen many phases ups and downs in the history of environmental campaigning over the last 50 years that's for sure but there is something that i find uh, really different and utterly uplifting about the speed with which young people around the world, starting with that iconic moment of Greta Thunberg outside the Swedish parliament, sure, one young woman holding up a handmade banner saying strike for the climate, but the speed with which that went from those origins through all sorts of different routes and involving thousands of young people, but eventually grew into a social movement which had seven million young people out on the streets of different cities within a year. Now that's an, you know, I'm, I can't find any comparison to the speed with which that happened. And for me, that has absolutely lifted my sense of what is now possible. And once we come through the COVID-19 crisis, what will be critical is how we work with young people, because a lot of them find it difficult, lonely, it's tough, you know, they're up against all the things that young people are facing in the world anyway. Huge numbers of young people suffering from burnout of one kind or another, you know, even after just one year, 18 months, two years of full-on campaigning. It, it is a really hard thing that we're asking of young people today. So what are the obligations for us now, who've been in it for a bit, as it were, how do we improve the quality of our engagement with young people, work alongside them, enable their voices to be heard even more eloquently than they already are. That actually is gonna be, for me, one of the biggest personal challenges for me. I, I mean, challenge in a good way, in that I want to devote myself to that much more over the next few years. I've also found it deeply heartening to see what happened in you know in the younger generation and I think that one of the reasons for this that was kind of a touchstone with Greta and also with XR is that what but those um those strikes and moments of civil disobedience tapped into was a very deep kind of sense that there's something dysfunctional and wrong and toxic about the way we are going about our you know, our lives mm. in the, particularly in the developed West, North, yeah. uh, you know, and, 
you know, the, the, the kind of the sense of, you know, wh why, what, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we, you know, constantly trying to make more money, buy more things, you know, all of these things that, you know, that kind of don't make a huge amount of sense when, when you actually dig into them. Um, and so there's this sense that perhaps wasn't, um, fastened on any yeah. one particular thing but this really tapped into a really deep sense for people of something is not right um and so i think you know in, in a sense that that all that energy has been kind of building up and, and, and waiting to have a way to express itself um and i think that you're right that those those of us who've been in uh, uh, to different degrees in the environmental movement over time need to be constantly in dialogue with those with with um, young people who are interested and engaged and have the energy to move forward with these bigger issues, the bigger questions, the real kind of questions is, do you know, why is this all not working? Um, and for us, for example, you know, we, we talked quite a long time about, you know, how do we engage young people? And of course, the answer is you don't engage young people, they engage themselves, and then you respond when the energy that is needed is precisely the energy that doesn't come from the center that comes from, you know, that comes from new energy, from new generations, from the margins, from, you know, those who have previously mm. been excluded and so i think in, in, in it's come up um both in the youth movement and it's now coming up with the black lives matter issue that you know this has to be led from those who are taking it forward and i think you're putting your finger on a really important thing which is kind of stitching this cloth of connectedness that we have i mean i i, I love the work that is done by countless local groups trying to protect their own local spaces in brilliant campaigns and utter dedication to whatever it might be. And, and we need to stitch that all the way through to the big picture about what is happening in the global environment, connecting, obviously, in your case, with the Stop Ecoside campaign. But we have to work at that because, to a certain extent, dedicated local conservationists are not necessarily giving a thought to the laws, the rules, that actually make their work still very important, but so precarious. Mm -hmm. Because you might win a battle one moment and then, God damn it, the next week you've got the same developers coming back with exactly the same kind of application dressed up to look differently. And the place that you're trying to protect is under as much pressure as it was before. So I feel there is a real pressure now on everybody running environmental organizations to help stitch those connections into the fabric of how we actually work together so that every local campaign would see that what it really is doing is being part of a global movement to totally transform the nature of our relationship with the natural world and that for me sometimes that works well with our very disparate diffuse environment movement in the uk sometimes you do find a comprehension gap that is pretty staggering. So we have to we have to get on and address that. And I know that's something that you're already thinking about, Jojo. So it's not a new challenge. Um, but I'm really interested. For instance, it has every single wildlife trust here in the UK joined up as signatories to the Stop Ecoside campaigns. You know, as a simple way of capturing the challenge. Yeah, we, we really look forward to the moment when that's the case. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're absolutely working on that specific messaging, actually, <laughs> to reach all of those, um, you know, to reach all of those uh, NGOs and all of those campaigns and groups, because that is, that is absolutely what needs to happen. It, it's a big sort of joining the dots exercise. Um, and I think, you know, we don't have time, even yep. if we wanted to, we don't have time to wait for the entire world to all sign up up to one campaign what we need is that is for all of the campaigns to understand what some of those underlying issues are because as you say you know we can have a, you know a local campaign to you know prevent some kind of destructive practice um, that simply comes back in different forms because ultimately it's allowed it's permitted um, and so you know it, the what once the I mean I think I think there's another issue actually that comes in here that's very interesting and that really links to the economic sphere. Now we've been dealing with an amazing um 
leader in this arena in France called Valérie Cabanez, who's been working on ecocide and rights of nature as well in, in the Francophone countries for many years. Um, and what she finds, she's spoken to, you know, rooms full of hundreds of NGO heads or hundreds of CEOs even. And what she's found is that, you know, those CEOs, for example, are actually relieved when they hear that it might be possible to criminalize ecocide. And that sounds, that may sound crazy, but actually so many of these people at a personal level would really like to be doing something different, to be doing things differently. And the flow of funds simply continues going the way it goes because it's legally permitted to do so. And the primary duty of those CEOs is to maximize shareholder return. But of course, they can only maximize it if they don't break criminal law. So they can't maximize shareholder return by going out and shooting people. So effectively, if we can make it the case that they also can't maximize shareholder return by destroying the planet, it, then we're actually onto a different track. We close one door and we start opening the door to the amazing ingenuity, inventiveness, entrepreneurship, as well as actually bringing in line people's economic activity with the values that they fundamentally hold. Because I have yet to have a conversation with anybody who fundament fundamentally believes that it's right to be just, you know, destroying the Amazon rainforest, for example. Nobody. And yet, the rules are not in place to actually have those values aligned with what people are doing. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's not just that it's legal to go on behaving in this ecocidal way. It is in many degrees mandated mm -hmm. because governments expect wealth creators to get out there and do what they should be doing, which often entails the destruction, continuing destruction of large parts of the natural world. You think about the insane proposal for HS2 here in the UK. This is a government decision. Now the contractors will go out there and with that government mandate, they will continue to destroy sites of special scientific interest, really important wildlife and woodlands. And they will do it with the full backing of a government that believes that that is an appropriate trade-off in order to promote that old fashioned kind of economic growth and prosperity. So you're right, changing this approach to wealth creation, enabling people to see wealth creation in a very different way is the act really and truly the fundamental challenge that we face. And I know that not everybody wants to get involved in economic discussions because boy, can it get tedious, but really we do have to think about how we're gonna change the rules of the economic game because that underpins pretty much everything. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's been an honour and privilege to have Jonathan Porritt on this conversation with me today. I hope you've all found it interesting and stimulating. You can pre-order Jonathan's book from good online booksellers. And please also check out stopecocide.earth for the latest on our work to make ecocide an international crime. Thank you. <laughs>